Assalamu alaikum and welcome to tonight's live show on Imam Hussein TV. Last week we aired a broadcast which was quite interesting, very popular as it were, specifically amongst women. Um, the program last week was titled The Images of Women in Shi'i Tradition. Last week we looked at the focus, well the focus last week was on role models, the narrations brought forward from women over the centuries and also what credence was given to those sort of narrations, what reliability factors there were and so on and so forth. Tonight's show we will be extending that theme of images of women in Shia tradition but we'll be looking at women as it were as career ladies or sisters or home carers and so also in this day and age we've seen a lot of people obviously that have migrated to the West and they have been aspiring as it were to develop, develop their degrees, pursue careers and so on and so forth. So what factors are involved for women in particular? Once again I'd like to welcome Dr. Sayyid Amar Naqshwani. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Shukran uh, for joining us again. Thank once you. Again. Uh, inshallah you are well and your family is well. very well, thank you. Um, tonight's topic hopefully should uh, gather some momentum again. And hopefully we should have some more calls. Uh, the telephone number for calls to actually come through are, is 0203 515 0199. You can also WhatsApp your telephone messages and questions for Sayedna 07939 Once again, 07939 Now this is a, hopefully, inshallah, a special topic once again where we'll be looking at really the um, focus or the traditions as it were around women in particular on being at home mm. or it pursuing careers. Now what's quite important just to set the momentum going as it were I'd like to probably first ask it what are the methodological issues around for women? The debate has always been and there's, it's got to be a fine balance here on should there be at home that's the one debate, one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is should they pursue careers or can there be a mixture? Can, they, can it really work as it were? What the factors are, what the pros and cons are. Let's analyse this together uh, inshallah. Hopefully we can bring in some sort of um, justice to um, the masses at large. So sure. just want to sort of probably kick off that. I feel like we're definitely going to need a second and a third and a okay. fourth okay. show with the same title. Right. And, you know, th the reason I say that is because, first and foremost, we're not going to please everybody with the answers that we give. Mm -hmm. Not that our aim necessarily is to please everybody, but there's going to definitely be debates because of what we're about to discuss. Because it may break the worldview or shatter the worldview or be completely different to the worldview, which some woman in the Muslim community may have. Okay. But when you're talking about methodological issues that are involved in this discussion, it's not an easy discussion to have because there's this mixture of looking at the legal traditions that are involved, looking at the worldview of one raised in the West versus one raised in the East, both in terms of the one giving the laws okay. and in terms of the person who has to be living as a Muslim, recognizing what Islamic law says. Okay. Then you've got the social issues that are involved, where you may live in a society where independence is seen as success. So therefore, if someone out there, for example, is, is 
independent in the sense that they have their own job right and they have their own means of an income and they are able to travel whenever they want and they are going and being promoted from one level to another continuously then that's glorified yeah. in some places yeah. in other places it's getting upon. married and bringing up the children is what's glorified yeah. yeah and then there are others who have found a balance between the two and then there are others who found that balancing the two was detrimental to their happiness. Yeah. So we've got legal issues, we've got social norms which we're discussing. We've also got the fact that in the West, where many of us are raised, we have the issue that there is a great amount of our sisters who have been wonderfully successful in their degrees at the universities that they went to. Yes. Yes. And so therefore, graduating from that university, naturally they would have wanted to work mm -hmm. not just to earn an income, but also having studied and gained those, those honors, you want to now fulfill, <coughs> fulfill your dreams, fulfill your aspirations. Absolutely. Now, when that happens, we're going to find certain legal issues that are going to arise, not just on the question of home versus career, but also the question of which career. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, is every career healthy to one's religious growth, spiritual growth? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there certain careers where you may encounter problems following Islam while practicing those careers? Yes, yes. Likewise, on the other hand, when you're at home <clears throat> and building this family, what happens when you feel down that there is a feeling that I haven't achieved what I've wanted to achieve? Mm -hmm. So now you've got There's this emotional aspect. Yeah, yeah. So you've got legal, social, emotional, all coming together. So all of these are methodological issues which we'll encounter in this discussion. Right, yeah. right, right. That's well said. Inshallah, hopefully we can then uh, dissect each of those parts. Inshallah. And I think uh, you're correct in saying that it, it may take more than one show, as it were, to break it down. Mm. And as it were, and, and all we can do is put it out there, as it were. Um, you're right in saying that obviously in the East and West there are differences, cultural differences, perceptions of how women should be, perhaps. And, you know, these are important and they can't be neglected. Mm. Let's probably start, first of all, from just the start of Islam. Bibi Khadija, Salaam alayhi 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 Also known as Umm al The blessed and most beloved wife of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and Ahlul Bayt alayhi alayhi Now, just to start from there, and then we'll continue, as it were, into the practical matters. Um, so she was clearly a business lady, very wealthy. She supported her husband, the Holy Prophet. She supported the Holy Prophet in the spread of Islam. Mm. But just for the viewers as well, and also sp specifically for men, did she continue her business as it were? And, and I'm saying this because for me, there's no reason why a Muslim she lady cannot continue and maintain a balance with agreement with her husband and so on and so forth. I mean, what, what, is, what is your view well, on that? There is the famous tradition that mm. this religion would have never been uh, successful were it not for the wealth of Khadija and the sword of Ali. Yeah. Now that gives us an indication that her wealth was instrumental. Okay in ensuring that Islam, especially in the early days of the religion of Islam, where it was extremely difficult in those early days uh, when the companions are facing the siege of the Meccans, mm -hmm. where you've got economic sanctions, where all of them have to go to the Sha'ab of Abu Talib. It's extremely difficult in those days and her wealth is instrumental. But that doesn't necessarily mean that she was working while mm -hmm. married. Yes. Um, what's clearly there is the fact that she employs 
the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, before he announces his prophethood. Okay. And she actually, sorry, she actually employed the Holy Prophet. Yes, she's employed the Holy Prophet, right. and he's making her, a, you know, great prophet. Uh, excuse the pun, and and you know the the business is going brilliantly well. But alongside that, there's a great amount of trustworthiness mm -hmm. that she witnesses from him. But there is no evidence whatsoever that when he announces his prophethood, that she continues working. Okay. Um, and there is there isn't any evidence as well that okay he marries her 15 years before he announces his prophethood. Right. There's no evidence that Khadija decides that I'll continue working a nine to five job, for example, and then I'll come home to my husband. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, there's this intention that we're going to build a family. Yes. Um, and what's interesting is that all of a sudden, what seems mundane yeah. in the world that we live in today, being a mother of a child, being a lady who's there in the house, ready for her husband when he comes home to be that partner who brings him peace and tranquility, that's actually given um, a divine touch when you look at Khadija and the Prophet, and then later when you look at Imam Ali and Fatwa Zahra salam, because the way the housewife is viewed, especially now, okay. is in many cases quite negative that she's just a housewife. Yeah, as yeah. if, especially <laughs> earlier on the show when you said to me, uh, do they stay at home or they get a career? Stay at home sounds like do we lock them at home? Mm -hmm. Do mm -hmm. we force them to be at home? These are a group of individuals who are not very intelligent who we leave at home. And that couldn't be further from the truth because what happens with Sayyidah Khadija is you've got this extremely successful lady who finds that being there to bring up this house, the members of this house, being there for her husband, she actually finds that this is something which helps her spiritual growth. Yeah. She actually finds it that it's an act of worshipping God. Right, right. So the world that we live in today sadly has, in my opinion, oppressed many females out there by giving this impression that the female, by staying at home, is therefore someone who's being oppressed or will definitely be depressed because she's been at home her whole life. That mother who has ensured that those sons and daughters have been raised in the best of ways, ways in which you will have a stronger nation. Yeah. You know, there's a saying attributed to Napoleon that give me good mothers, I'll give you a strong nation. Right. That mother who has instilled morals, that mother who has sacrificed day and night mm -hmm. to ensure that the next generation is a healthy generation, that's not something to be frowned upon. No, no. So with Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam, while yes, there are many out there who say the reason I'm working where I work is because of Sayyidah Khadija. Yes, Sayyidah Khadija showed that you can be a lady in the middle of a maybe arrogant male dominated scene who can still earn an income for herself. But what's interesting is when she gets married, she finds more pleasure okay. in helping to build the household with the person who she sees as the love of her life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now that could be the dilemma that could be faced by some people today. Yeah. When there are certain ladies in our community who graduate from university and work in pharmacy, in medicine, in uh, law, in optometry, when they do go into those fields, some people have the wrong impression that the reason they've gone into those fields is because they don't want to be the traditional housewife, mother, okay. and so on. No, sometimes they're not getting married. That could be the reason. If they got married, then they're more than happy to build mm -hmm. this divine structure in society right. known as you know, the household. Yeah, sure. So sometimes I think we can also be unfair towards those who are working because some people say, look at all these modern girls, all they're concentrating on is their career and their independence. No, that girl, the moment she gets married, may be a lady who builds the best house in the world, but she just has not had the proposals yes. or what we call the qisma, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in some cases, yes. coming towards her way. Right. So while we see that Sayyidah Khadija, when she got married, preferred okay. Okay. to be in the house and preferred to be a backbone for her husband. You know, when he receives revelation, 
he finds that this is the lady who is going to bring him the strength that he mm -hmm. needs mm -hmm. with this very weighty message, that shouldn't mean that we negatively look at our sisters who have decided to have a career because at the end of the day, those sisters have graduated with wonderful honors yeah, sure. and deserve to be out there. But of course, there are other issues that may come up while they're out there in their career. Okay, yeah. I mean, we'll come to we'll come to probably the Sharia aspects, as mm. it were, further into the show. But in terms of choice now, let's start from, first of all, single women. And then we'll go to married women as well, if, if I may. Single women who wish to pursue careers, as it were, and as you've said, you know, they have um, been successful in their education, they've achieved degrees, doctorates, and so on and so forth. What sort of obstacles are they facing these days? Is it, is it due to cultural backgrounds, do you think? Is it due to an influence from an overwhelming manly social structure that, you know, this is mm. how, it, this is the best place. Sure, sure, sure. What, what's, what do you think needs changing? Well, I think that there are certain cultures mm -hmm. that are wary of sending their daughters out to the world where there is mixing with those who are of the opposite gender and those who are not mahram to them. Yeah, yeah. This could either be a cultural belief or it may be a religious belief. I remember Ayatollah al khui may uh -huh. Allah bless his soul. Sure. There's, it's quoted in the work uh, Salat al Najat. Okay. Ayatollah al khui may Allah bless his soul, mentions clearly that he does not allow for a woman to go out and work in a mixed environment. Now, this okay. is a, a shocker to some. Yeah. And especially some of Ayatollah al khui's followers probably on this area right. are going to reassess the position. But for Ayatollah al-Khu'i, you know, going out and working in that mixed environment is not allowed. You know, Ayatollah al-Khu'i was also a believer in the face veil, that if, for example, um, there is a fear that your wife, by showing her face, even though allowed, you know, it's allowed to have the face exposed, but there is a fear of some fitna, then the wife will have to cover her face. He was quite... what. Well, some would call strict on this area. Um, but he would say, for example, a woman going out to work at an all ladies school, for example, an all girls school, okay. there's no issue there. Right. Or she's working in an all girls environment, there's no issue there. He allows that. But for the woman to go out and work in a mixed environment, there was that fear right. that working in such mixed environments could bring more harm than good. Okay. There is the interaction then with the opposite gender. Who's not mahram to you? Who's making jokes with you all the time while you're working together? Mm -hmm. Where you may begin to slowly compromise your social hijab, which many people neglect. Yeah. This idea that I'm wearing a physical hijab at my workplace, that's more than enough. But mm -hmm. there is also the social hijab which I think many of our sisters are, are phenomenal in the way they handle themselves. Right. But there is that chance where you begin to give more information about your private life to people okay. who are not <laughs> necessarily legally related to you. Yeah. You find someone who's willing to listen to you more um, emotionally. You're spending nine hours of the day with certain people who may open up to you more than your husband may open up to you. Mm -hmm. So you feel that when you come back home, for example, your husband, when you come back home, they're not paying you any attention. Yeah. But while you are at work from nine to five, you feel that the friend across the table is listening to all that you've got to say and is laughing at and what joking. you're saying, yeah. joking yeah. Yeah. with what you're yeah. saying. You're free. You're, you're, you're free. So yeah. Ayatollah yeah. al-Khu'i was of the belief that women working in environments of you know same gender Okay, there's no issue. It's jais. But opposite gender, they're not allowed. Now, some parents may be like that. There are some mm. who may take that opinion and say that, listen, we want to safeguard um, our daughter's reputation. Right. Because we believe that 
allowing her to work in the mixed environment. They're not denying that. Listen, you want to work in, for example, there are many sisters in the community in London who went on to teach, mm. for mm. example, at the Islamic schools. Yes, yes. And there are some sisters who went on to, you know, to teach in their local schools, meaning the local community schools. Is it obligatory on that sister to work? No, it's not. Right. You see, what, 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 there's a dilemma here that people aren't understanding, and that is that idea that I want to work to earn a living in Islam is not something obligatory for you. No. If you're, if you're still being maintained by your parents, not obligatory for you to go out and work. You may want to go out and fulfill your dreams, mm. but not at the cost of sacrificing your principles. Right, right. Not at the cost of sacrificing what the religion teaches you. Okay. Because don't say that this then becomes a necessity. That if I don't go out and work, then that's it. I'm now going to you know, throw a fit because I'm not allowed to go out and work. Mm. Islam says there's no harm. Go out and work. But you have to be wary okay. that where you've gone to work, is it a place which is going to get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of that 5 p.m., 6 p.m. Yeah. closing time or further away? Sure, sure. Do you find yourself beginning to compromise on certain aspects of your religiosity mm -hmm. or not? Mm -hmm. No one's saying you have to work. No one's saying you can't work. Okay. But what we're saying is that all of us, male and female, have to have a reflection on where we're working. What is the taqwa? Is it growing, okay. the God consciousness, right. or is it decreasing? Okay, okay, alhamdulillah. We'll, cut, we'll, we'll extend what you've just mentioned in terms of the pressures and the niya, as it were, that you've probably highlighted, really. In terms of, let's, let's be honest here now, okay? Women, men and women, both work in the city, mm aspiring to progress, get promoted, as it were, move up the ranks. Um, aside from maintaining, and you've also already touched upon this in terms of hijab and having that, what are the sort of um, rules around, for example, having perfume at work, for example? Um, and, and the reason I'm bringing this in now is that we can join it. Well, I, I think you bringing this in yeah. is something fundamental. Why? Yeah. Because you may say, what's the rule on wearing perfume to work? Yeah. You're now entering a territory of the social hijab. Mm. Mm. You know, I, I, don't have, I don't have no issue whatsoever in terms of the physical hijab because many of our sisters are absolutely amazing in the physical hijab. We don't know how it feels to no, go on a train no, no. at 7.30 a.m. Yep. with everyone staring at you when you're wearing your hijab. Most definitely. But you're now bringing in the social hijab, and that is where there is an issue when it comes to the fulfilling of one's aspirations in a particular career. Yeah. Now, for example, Ayatollah Sistani and a lady wearing perfume. Now, you know you're going to work. You don't want to be the one who everyone's saying that one's got a B.O. problem, that one's got a stink problem, that one smells from a mile away. No, Ayatollah Sistani allows you to wear perfume when you're leaving the house. Okay. But of course, your intention, and you mentioned fundamentally what mm. we'll find in a lot of the discussions on Islamic law, is there's the intention playing a major role. Yeah. My intention wearing this perfume is not to attract the guys in the workplace to say that, you know what, can you guess what perfume I'm wearing or yeah, you yeah, smell sure. amazing. But rather, my intention behind it is... Fulfilling the sunnah. Fulfilling the sunnah, because, you know, perfume is one of the only areas you could do israf in, mm. extravagance. Mm. Mm. Um, and also, representing the religion of Islam. Yeah. You know, yeah. you don't want to be thinking that every time I come across a Muslim, I always come across one that stinks. Okay. You know, sometimes okay. you go to Umrah or Hajj and you're sitting in the plane. Yes. You've got certain people, yani, for the love of God, go out and buy a deodorant. Yeah, sure. Go out and buy some perfume. Yeah, yeah. And you're sitting there, and there are some you may sit next to, and you're wondering how have they been married to each other? Does that man have to wake up? Does that she have to wake up mm. every day to that? Yeah. So, perfume, for example, allowed. Wearing ring, for example. Okay. Wearing your rings, going to work. Okay, okay. That's allowed. Right. Wearing, you know, something Makeup. on your eyelash, for example, like yes. the 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 um, some will use this makeup on the eyes this is allowed I okay see. so that is allowed and, sorry just to say and yeah. uh, that being allowed and just going back to my initial point or query is that allowed for single and married women in terms of married woman we mentioned earlier mm -hmm. 
The Ayatollah al khui and Ayatollah al Sistani both are of the opinion. Right. And this opinion, we need a different slant. Yeah, slant to discuss it in depth. But both are of the opinion that while the face can be shown, Zina on that face is not yeah. something that can just be shown to everybody, mm. except to your husband, okay. except to your. Mahram. You know, those who are mahram to you. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the face has to be covered. Right. Now, I know there are certain people out there who will say, well, the face veil and the niqab and the burqa and all of these things. I have an issue with the governments of the time. We leave the governments of the time discussion, and we've already discussed this, mm -hmm. I think, in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, the government of the time situation. Yeah. However, when we are saying that the kuhl can be worn on the eyes, or rings can be worn, or perfume can be worn, all of these are permissible for that person who's going towards the workplace. Right. There is no harm in any of these. But now you may face other issues, other complications when you're going to the workplace in relation to certain areas of the social and the physical hijab. Right, right. Like which areas do we always get emails on? in terms of the city life which areas do people always ask us on yeah, yeah you know which areas you'll always see in the emails what do people ask us on they'll ask us for example on alcohol, alcohol yeah. now one of the biggest problems you'll face <coughs> is you've got man or woman is that let's not limit this to woman no 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 man let's or woman they want a career mm -hmm. the man says to you ya allah you have said to me that i have to maintain my family yeah so therefore i have to maintain my family means that i have to earn a living for my family as we know a woman in Islam does not have to earn her living. The man, her husband is the one who has to maintain. Okay. That person or that lady who's done amazingly well. You know, she's maintained all her social hijab. Then they've told that, listen, there is a deal on the table. But we're going to have to have champagne on that table to conclude this deal. Mm. And that champagne is right in front of you. Am I allowed to remain there on that table or no? Now, some will say, look, I'm not going to drink. Yeah. But how many <coughs> fell from the ladder when they slowly started to get close with that particular scene? Mm -hmm. Beginning, it was nothing. Yeah. Diet Coke, Diet Coke, Diet Coke. Orange juice, orange juice, orange juice. Maybe they moved on the next level, Red Bull, Red for Red example, Bull, yes. with the ginger ale. And, and even things with ale and beer, they started <laughs> saying that even these have doubts because of the namings. Then from there... There are some Muslims in the workplace, they have drunk more than non-Muslims. And I remember even being on a flight once where, when they said to me, alcohol, I said, you know, I'm, I'm fasting, I'm Muslim. So I said, yeah, but so many other Muslims have drunk. Mm. And you begun to realize that even there are, there are some Muslims in the workplace it's normal for don't really care. So you've got this major issue now. What do I do? Because in this case, this lady has worked her socks off to reach this position, let's say in a big bank. Okay. Firm. And what they're telling her is that you have to attend this conference. Okay, yeah. I have to attend the conference. Yes, yes. But when I attend this conference, I'm also going to, uh, you know, some of the most important promotions occur not at the conference, at the drink session, at the they end do. of a Friday or That's Saturday right. night. That's right. I was just going to mention, yeah, Friday night. Yeah. Friday night. Inviting you to the pub and this, that. Inviting you to the pub. There are some people got promoted because of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sure you've seen. Yes. People got promoted yes. because of buying a drink or being the type yeah, of person yeah. who gives a good laugh to yeah. someone in a position higher than them. One of the lads. One of the lads. Hmm. Now, there are some of our sisters who have done remarkably well, where right from the beginning they have said that I could not be at functions where alcohol is served. Yeah. And I yeah. have great admiration for them because they said from the beginning that this is our principles. Then there are others who are like, well, you know what, at the end of the day, I'm not going to drink the... Razak, the sustainer, mm -hmm. is one. Yes. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam yes, says so. in the Munajat, Mawla ya Mawla, anta al raziq wa ana al marzuq, wa hal yarhamu al marzuq illa al raziq. My master, oh my master, you are the sustainer, and I am the sustained. Who is there for the sustained except the sustainer? Mm, if I truly believed, that my Lord is the one who writes my sustenance. You think I'm going to care about manager X and Y that I have to compromise my values? But you may find in that situation some of our sisters 
who are mosque goers, mm -hmm. who are even ziyara goers, who are people who take their kids to the madrasa and you know they want them to grow up as aspiring believers. Yeah. They'll be like, listen, let them order their drinks. We're having a, you know, we're not going to be drinking, no. and we're also going to make sure that our section is eating fish, 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 or if there's halal, halal, for example. But slowly, when you start to compromise one value then how many other values begin to yeah, be compromised? Yeah, sure, sure. I think personally, this is really down to what is your goal spiritually? Is it, for example, to live a nice traditional life, you know, um, coming from the sort of Indo-Pak background, you know, many years back, it was really about, well, nice dinner, Indian film, mm. chill out. Doesn't matter, like you mentioned, you know, we can go to a restaurant here and there and if there's booze there's booze if there's not it doesn't matter you know as long as we're not drinking it but do you th also think it's really about a lack of men and women understanding that the goal to them may be that well I just want to be you know just do the minimum and be a good music good Muslim in my eyes but you know Marifa of Allah that can come later on down the line because I think that that has a place also because of family structure, cultural upbringing, tarbiya, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I, th I think there's, there's two factors which yeah. are fighting each other. Yeah. One is keeping up with the Joneses. Mm. Yeah. Um, they have that house with those cars at that private school because both of them are working their socks off. Yeah. We don't look at whether their sex life is healthy. Mm -hmm. We don't look at whether they have their tiffs on a regular basis. We don't even look at whether they come back both knackered, not wanting to see each other. Yeah. The main thing is the house looks big. The cars are there. The private schools are there. So if we're going to keep up with them, we're both going to have to work. So you've got that battle that's taken place where the husband and the wife are both working mm -hmm. simply because they want to keep up with the Joneses of their community. Yeah, yeah, of course. Doesn't matter if we don't see each other the whole day or we come back drained. Mm. Then, on the other hand, there are those who are saying that in this day and age, it's not easy to maintain the mortgage yeah, unless both of us work. Yeah, absolutely. You've got you to know, be practical. And, 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 and these are people who truly work sincerely to build a household of lovers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, but at the same time they're saying, listen, we both have to put our hours in. The problem we have mm -hmm. is what happens when those hours means that you come back on a Tuesday night and it's Imam al Jawad's Shahada at mm. the mosque. Oh, I'm drained. Can't be bothered. Let's watch it online. Online, hardly anyone stays watching for that hour. The kids are jumping. Yeah. The phone is ringing. The WhatsApp is moving. The food is cooking. Oh, you know what? I have work the next day. He has work the next day. So Imam al-Sadiq, Shahada. Mm, you know what? Let's just go 10th of Muharram and 23rd of Ramadan. Yeah. yeah. And sadly, what began to happen is sometimes those hours brought a decrease in our spirituality. Mm. Mm. Now we have to begin to ask ourselves this question. And we're focusing here images of women in, in Shia tradition. What happens if my hours means I come back drained? Because when we talk of rights of the husband, rights of the wife in Islam, the rights of the wife, she has to be maintained. Yeah. Doesn't have to cook. Doesn't have to clean. Doesn't have to do all these household chores. One of the things they say is for her to be ready for her husband. Now, you're going out to work, come home. Husband has a hack over you on this area. You come back drained. And you're neglecting each other. Now, let's not look at those husbands who may be stubborn or maybe arrogant at that moment. Let's look at those husbands who may at that moment say, hey, don't worry, it's okay. You know how long that lasts, that don't worry, it's okay? 
How long does that last? Let me, let, let's be frank here. Yeah. So yeah. that just in case people are living in cuckoo land, let's be frank. <laughs> hey, you know, I've missed you the whole day. Um, let's go to the bedroom. Let's mm -hmm. go upstairs. Let's go wherever. Let's, you know, some want to be more formal and others want to be more impulsive, for example. They want to there and then at that moment. You know, I'm drained. He's like, yeah, but, okay, babe, you know what, I, 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 I appreciate what you're going through. It's okay. An hour later, that guy's mind's wandering. Yeah. And that guy's mind's already thinking, you know, I'm not getting nothing here. Drain, 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 drain. Mr. and Mrs. Smith are always drained. He's working long hours, she's working long hours. She wants to knock out. But she's not in the mood. Managers pissed her off at work. Not in the mood. And her not being in the mood. I'm in the mood. Mm. Men only think from one place. Yeah. But she's not in the mood. Now, obviously, I, I at this moment, what do I begin to think? My mind begins to wander. Mm -hmm. But I have the decency in me to say that, you know what, my wife's struggling. Give it time. Yeah, sure. Once this becomes a norm, I'm not in the mood, I'm tired. I'm not in the mood, I'm tired. I'm tired, I'm not in the mood. Someone has to begin to reassess this golden keeping up with the Joneses world and dream that I have. Is it clashing with the rights which Islam has ordained? Yeah. Because if there's a clash, then the haq or the hukuk, mm. which Islam has spoken about, the rights which Islam right. has spoken about, have to come above. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. believe you me, one of the biggest problems and frustrations that leads to divorce, there are some who divorced with mansions. <laughs> How many do you know divorced with mansions? Yeah. It's not mansion. Many people. But they divorce with a mansion. And there are some who divorce Beautiful cars, kids at private school. So everyone's moody when they're coming yeah, home. Yeah, yeah. Moody. Yeah. Sometimes, not all, mm -hmm. sometimes that lady who they said is the housewife, boring, bringing up the kids, not seeing a divine element in what she's doing. Yeah. Sometimes she's the one who's got a bit, even though she's had... A difficult day as well, yeah. but not the same pressures as no, Moorgate no. and Oldgate and yeah. Barbican and Manhattan's avenues and Wall mm -hmm, Streets mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, this business district. Maybe those divorces happened. Maybe. Not all the time. Because yeah. it can happen the other <laughs> way as well. But maybe those divorces also happened because you started to take too much on in a world where there was no buzz anymore yeah. when... Yeah. You are coming home. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think that's a, a real big issue here. Viewers will be going into a break very shortly. Please do call in for your questions. The telephone number is 0203 515 0199. WhatsApp, also your messages 07939 917 163. We're going to be going off air in a moment or two. So now we'll probably come back after the break and we'll look at um, issues around perhaps um, women in prominent positions, barriers, as it were, obstacles that they face, uh, more challenges involved, uh, and probably more. So uh, do join us again after the break. Asalaamu As Alaikum. <laughs> and welcome back to tonight's live show on Imam Hussein TV where we're looking at the images of women in Shia tradition and focusing on ladies or sisters 
being or pursuing a career or being home carers as well. Sayyidina, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Um, just before the break, we you mentioned about possible breakdowns, as it were. Yeah. Now let's just focus on the flip side on su successful results or positive results, as it were, where it's the other way. Mm. Um, for you know marriages, you mentioned obviously you know there are uh, sisters out there or women out there who are housewives, perhaps you know not trying to limit them as it were, and they're doing the best deed. They, you know, according to their family structure, you know, raising, educating children, and so on and so forth, and you know they are, um, you know, they are also facing challenges. As you mentioned, you know, you've got monthly, weekly, hourly deadlines in the city all over the world, as you mentioned, on so and so forth uh, companies. And there's no clash there. So in terms of success there, what can we sort of gauge from that, as it, as it were? I think it's all about communication, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you to begin your marriage. Mm -hmm. And maybe at the beginning when there's no children, I think some have achieved a wonderful balance where they believe that they needed to... Okay. Uh, start the early years struggling to build the household. Okay. Both working quite hard. Right. And then after that, the communication will dictate. You know who will continue to be the breadwinner. Yeah, sure. Maybe they can both work hand in hand. But the main thing is, it doesn't begin to affect them when they return back home. Okay. To the okay. detriment of that household. Okay. So now we have a caller on the line. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Yes, uh, sister, get your question, please. Okay, um, so, Sayyidina, um, basically every week I get a lot of sisters confiding in me and they tell me that they feel like they're being let down by this ummah. They're confiding in me and telling me that they're being beaten or even sexually abused by their husbands and their family members. And they're too afraid to speak out because of what the community will do to them. And I have revert sisters telling me about how disrespected they are, how they're being used and abused through marriage, and that the community just protects the individuals that have shattered their lives. And these sisters, they, they have little faith left in Islam because they're starting to see it as a religion that only cares about the welfare of men. Mm -hmm. And I just, the thing is, like, I really just want to inspire you, Sayyidina, and like any, all of our noble scholars that might be watching this to continue speaking out for us and speaking about our issues, because it's all well and good for us telling the non-Muslims that Islam doesn't oppress women, but when our actions are contradicting our words, you know, they, they just see us as hypocrites. And this is a religion that made women like Sayyida Fatima, Sayyida Zainab, Um Kulthum, Hamida, Sabiqa, some of the best scholars that have ever lived. So what I, I just really want to see from Sayyid Ammar and our other noble scholars, may Allah bless you, is please just be bold in bringing forward our issues because this is the only way to, we can hope to change the mentality of the people. We need to encourage our girls to seek Islamic knowledge so they can be the future female scholars that our girls can go to for help and that they can represent the sisters as a whole. And I know that my words are difficult to hear, but I just really hope that this inspires you, inshallah. Barakallah fiqun. Inshallah, shukran. Thank you, sister. Yeah, thank you, sister. Islam doesn't oppress women. Muslims do. Yeah, yeah. There's no doubt Muslim men out there, in some cases, their behaviors are are atrocious and um, you know this domestic abuse no doubt is the worst of all mm -hmm. when a person is ready to you know beat his wife or slap his wife and you know you hear these stories all the time and and many of us are trying to speak out against these areas there are many campaigns which are trying to speak out I'm not saying it's perfect far from it but I think with shows like this hopefully we can begin to educate more the men of our community mm -hmm. in terms of their rights and their responsibilities right especially in terms of their wives um there are many out there with their wives who have neglected them 
and sometimes emotional abuse is as bad as physical abuse. Yeah, yeah. And I thank the sister for, you know, raising this. Mm. But we're trying our hardest as well with these shows to try and remove the arrogance that exists in some of the patriarchal societies. If I may just add, um, and I had a, a point to actually bring to uh, your attention for this show, and hopefully you can benefit the sister and sisters out there. I personally think there should be some sort of bureau or an office where sisters can actually go and get some sort of guidance from a fellow sister, mm. as it were, a, f a female, who can actually guide her. Now, naturally, a lot of men would say, well, that's wrong because that's clashing with what goes on in our homes and so on and so forth. But they also need to express what's going on, as it were, in a halal and fair way. And I don't think it, they're being heard entirely at all. No, uh, I agree with you. Uh, I agree uh, with you. That uh, needs to be hostels. It's a big issue, yeah. definitely. I think there needs to be hostels, number yeah. one, for yeah. sisters who are in the middle of the night being beaten black and blue by their mm. husbands. Mm. I think that's the first thing. And I think, secondly, there needs to be resident alimas as well as resident alimas. Exactly. You know, there are many communities which have a maulana who is always male. But why not have... Yep. You know, a, a, a lady who can represent the sisters as well mm -hmm. and hear them out. Yes. And maybe these are steps which some communities have taken and which we can also implement in the near future. Right. Yeah. So there's a question I have for you, uh, Sayyid Omar. Uh, hi. My question to Sayyid Omar is that should a woman delay having children for the sake of making her career, or is that frowned upon from an Islamic perspective? Now... You know, the, of course, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, we follow his sunnah and everything. Mm -hmm. And if he felt that, you know what, the best thing for me is to postpone having children so that the religion of Islam can spread. Mm -hmm. Or that Imam Ali salam said to Fatwa al-Zahra when they got married, that, you know what, let's wait before we have any children mm -hmm. so that we can build our lives together. What many don't realize is when a child comes into your life, Yes. There's a third door of rizq open for you. Right. So you've got the rizq which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you. Mm -hmm. You've got the rizq which um, is promised to your wife. And now you've got the rizq that is the child and is promised to the child. Um, and the Holy Prophet has the famous tradition that, you know, get married and increase your number. And I will be proud even of the miscarried uh, baby on the day of judgment. Right. So while, of course, the decision is between the husband and the wife, and you know yourselves better than anyone, certainly in Islam, it's highly recommended um, to have children and to build the family. Yeah. yeah. OK. So the questions are going to be coming in quite uh, um, fast, as it were. Let's now look at possibly, and I don't mean to be rude here, and I'm sure Sayyid uh, Amar doesn't mean to be as well. But perhaps professions which can be problematic, um, you know, for, you know, um, compromising the harmony at home. Specifically, for example, positions where, you know, that females may sort of encounter or go towards what, what what do you think about that, as it were? Um, so, uh, I don't know if the profession is always the problem, right? Or if how you socially maintain your hijab in that profession mm -hmm. is sometimes an issue. Okay. And that could be for any profession, mind you. You could even be working in an Islamic school as a Muslim woman from nine till three, then you, your interaction with the male teachers in that school can bring about a problem, you know, within the household. And maybe that's why Ayatollah al khuti was adamant that, you know what, if women want to work, they can work, but in female-only environments. Now, let's say there are other environments which are fundamental for the growth of any society and jobs which are fundamental, careers which are fundamental, mm -hmm. there are always going to be certain issues which emerge where a person has to begin to ask themselves that is this compromising my 
spirituality or no. Now, let me give you an example. Yeah. The females in our community, for example, decide to want to become doctors. Mm -hmm. There are a number of issues that emerge where however great the need is for those female doctors, and even in the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, there was that lady by the name of Shifa or Layla, who was, you know, a, a lady treating those who were um, going through illnesses mm -hmm. in Arabia. So even though it's recommended, recommended to seek knowledge and, you know, science and biology and chemistry, physics, all these natural sciences are fundamental for all. There is still the element there that there's going to be certain issues while working where a person's social and physical hijab may be compromised. Now, okay. what do we do? Yeah. So, for example, the good thing about many of the hospitals, even when we're living in, in the Western world, in countries which are not predominantly Muslim-majority countries, is that gloves you know, are, are fundamental. Hmm. You know, and I think that barrier of gloves solves a lot of issues. Sure. But then we had the issue which female doctors faced where you had bare below the elbow. Yeah, yeah. Where this area had to be um, exposed. Now what happens, because in Islam, this has to all be covered, the face and the hands. Yes, this area can be shown, but now you're saying bare below the elbows. That means that when they're wearing, they're going to... So that became an issue where certain hospitals try to find a solution for their female Muslim doctors, mm -hmm. where some said, well, let us wear some form of plastic there. Others yeah. said, let us wear something under, you know, the scrubs, the scrubs. that we wear, yes. you know. So you had this debate that emerged. Then you had the female Muslim doctor who's wearing hijab. Yeah, yeah. That some will say that this is a foreign object that can't be in the operating theater. Mm -hmm. What many don't realize is, okay, how about if a Muslim female doctor decides that she'll have a hijab which is specific for the operating theater and not to be used anywhere else. Okay. Okay? Yes. So that could be something that can be worn which is specific for the operating theater. Then you have, for example, when uh, the woman is touching someone, you've gone to the female doctor, am I allowed to go to that female doctor? I've got a cold, for mm -hmm, example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That female Muslim doctor in that case, gloves, once again, is something which is highly recommended um, within these hospitals to be worn and that barrier is enough yes yes because many people will ask that so can i if i'm going to be a doctor i'm going to have to touch somebody of course as long as there's no lustful intentions no sexual you know intention there which i you know god forbid happens but you'll see that the majority will follow an oath where they're going to be ethically responsible or they don't even you may look at that as a private part. They look at it as a tube that's blocked and needs to be worked on. You know, they can get into that mode, right. for example. Um, and then you've got, for example, some of the nurses out there who may have to wash the body of somebody who's not mahram to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but again, you can use gloves to wash that body, but without having to look at the uh, private, private parts. parts. Um, so you've got all of these situations where the profession isn't an issue. Okay. I know there was an issue Ayatollah al Khu'i had with whether it's a man or a woman going into certain areas of the legal world. Right. You know, maybe areas of criminal law where mm -hmm. there's going to be a problem with the contradictions with Islamic law on certain judgments you're going to have to make. But in terms of, for example, female, male touching na mahram issues. Some will say, okay, but if I'm going to be a female in the workplace, I'm going to have to shake everybody's hands. Well, the lady from the beginning can turn around and say that, you know, part of our Islamic tradition is that this is the way we shake hands. Or some go like this, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Unless, of course, it becomes something that harms the image of the religion of Islam. Some of the ulama may say that's something that brings embarrassment. Right. There may be a discussion on that area. Okay, okay. So all of these are things to consider. But for me, mm -hmm. what from the emails that I'm receiving and from some of the things that I'm witnessing, it's more of a case of the, the psychological and sometimes physical pressures yeah. when you're coming back to your husband at home 
and the husbands can be the naggiest and the most difficult anyway when they've had a long day. But when you're coming back and the two of you don't have that same desire, desire or spark or you're just drained, then the minds begin to wander. Mm. And did we really both need to work, work. those last long hours? Yes, yes, yes. Weren't things going well? Couldn't we have balanced it in a different way? But each situation is, of course, different. Sure, yeah. okay. So we have a question now, um, Zina. Um, Salam, Dr. Amar from Pakistan. I want to know about social hijab. You said social hijab term. C uh, you, you mentioned the social hijab term. Can you please explain it in detail, sir? Uh, respect and love from Pakistan. Stay blessed. Uh, yeah, I don't know how easy social hijab yeah. is in the workplace these I, I, days. Why? I, because you've got to be part of the banter. But also, also, I think the social hijab, I think it's more of a term that's used in the West uh, and perhaps in the East it's less known. It's less so known, but it still needs to be mentioned. Why? Absolutely. Because even in the East, yeah. you can still find a situation where your husband's at work, mm -hmm. you're at work. And you're mixing. You're mi and here's, the, here's a problem which I don't think anyone has put their finger on at the moment. And I'm starting where? I'm starting with even cousins. Yeah, yeah. Now, let's not go to the workplace. Mm. Are we allowed in Islam? And I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings by discussing this, but are we allowed in Islam to even go out double dating? Mm. Like, you know, sometimes two, uh, the husband and his best friend, mm -hmm. the wife yes, and, yes. and the best friend's wife. Yeah. Are we allowed that in Islam? Interaction. Or not, laughing and joking as a Muslim woman wearing physical hijab, but social hijab. Are we allowed that? Where we're letting ourselves go, basically, a little bit. Yeah. Are, are we allowed that or not? For example, how about my brother's wife? Am I allowed to be chilling with my brother's wife, who's not mahram to me? Now. When we're finding that these have become a norm now, that, you know, I, I could be chilling with my brother's wife and we're going out together in the car to pick something up while my brother's at home. Majority of people out there will say, listen, listen your brother's wife, nothing's going to happen. Mm. We don't work on probability. No, no. And many, uh, many a person out there can tell you of, uh, of a story of um, how their own family member ruined their marriages. But when we see that there's that social hijab, which Islam has already ordained in terms of who you can mix and socialize with, who you can't mix and socialize with, those who have already passed those stages where they hug their cousins who are not mahram mm -hmm. to them, where they kiss their cousins yeah, who are not mahram the to them, those ones, when they go to work, it's normal. They look at it and they're like, well, you know what? I'm not exactly going to hug everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've and worked. there are many out there who will tell you, I've worked for 15 years yeah, yeah. and I've never drunk alcohol and I've never gone to the bar with anyone. Ask her, how many hugs? She like, I might have just hugged like... 50. Not even numbers. <laughs> I might have hugged my gay friend at work because the gay friend is not attracted to the opposite gender. So okay, that's still fine. not permissible. Okay, I might have hugged the odd person. Well, I didn't hug them, but they hug me. Good point. And I don't find a way in which I could tell them, stop hugging. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we've been hugging now for the last seven and a half years. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to offend we've each other. We've been hugging for seven and a half years. <laughs> but you said to me that when you were at that workplace, you were able to stay away from alcohol. In Islam, staying away from alcohol is a great feat. But if there's other areas where now you're... Social hijab is that you find it normal to hug somebody because they've known them for so long, then there becomes an issue. Marshall. Now, with that social hijab as well, there might be that banter in that workplace. And that banter might lead on to, you know what, let me just go down for, let's get a coffee together. You want to do lunch this week? There are many out there who are not going to be affected by lunch with a colleague at work. There are some who were. Yeah. There are some whose marriages yeah. were broken. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are some who found that that colleague at work was ready to listen to all their problems, that they found more empathy from that colleague than their cold husband at home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, that person's wearing brilliant hijab. They're wearing physical hijab, which is brilliant. 
But is that enough? This is a question we have to ask. Well, Shola, I think you've um, quite brilliantly broken that down. And I think there is definitely um, a neglect, an oversight, mm. ignorance, as it were, from a lot of people who, yeah. from my understanding, from my understanding and um, my observance, have this notion, well, you know, you can't judge me. And it always comes back to that, you see. Mm. And I can do what I want, and I'm not doing anything. As you mentioned, you know, I refrain from alcohol, but I can mm. do this. My knee is, is clean. And the interpretation of Sharia, the fiqh, I think has been destroyed by a lot of people. No, I, I, but, but some of them are innocent. They so are. I, I have I'm, to say this, yeah, yeah, yeah. that I believe... I believe that there are many out there who try and have a wonderful Islamic lifestyle at work, at home. They try and balance it. Some have balanced it brilliantly, by the way. Mm -hmm. let's, let's be clear about that. There are yes. some couples who have balanced this brilliantly. But then I'm just, just hesitant on certain areas that I'm witnessing where I'm like, thinking that, you know what, even with that brilliant physical hijab, the banter at the workplace can sometimes mean that we're letting go of ourselves spiritually mm -hmm. to the detriment not just of us, but to our marriages as yeah, well. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Totally agree. Mind you, there are many ladies out there who will even say to you that I, I worked, career, there's nothing more beautiful than looking in my kids' eyes. Mm. And there are many ladies out there who are on six-figure salaries. And I tell you what, they wish, they wish in their late 30s now they have a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Believe you me. No, no. no. They've done brilliant in career. Yes, yes. But they're depressed because where's the kid? Yeah, the fulfillment. There's no child. Mm. And the Quran didn't just say, have a child. There are many Muslim couples out there. Have a child. The maid is doing the work, not them. No. Yeah. This is something I'd like to focus on. Yeah, definitely. The maid yeah. has brought up that kid. That kid, mom and dad have only had a, made a statement to the rest of their circle that we have a kid. Yes. Where's mom? Traveling. Where's dad? Yeah. Traveling. Where's yeah. mom? Traveling. Where's dad? Traveling. So who's looking after the kid? Yes. That poor maid is the one who's looking after the Absolutely. kid. And when the maids begin to look after our kids, and the parents are not there, and the warmth of a mum, the heart of a mum, the nourishment physically and emotionally of a mum, once that begins to go missing, yeah. all yeah. sorts begins to happen. A child is not a statement for me to tick the boxes of life. A child is a form of rizq from God. Sure. Therefore, there are some out there who are having children, but they're having children just to tick a box, box? that I don't get. I don't get in a state of depression at 38 that I've not had a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll come back to that point just now. Um, just to intervene, um, there's a question here. It's been hanging on for some time. Salam. I just wanted to share my personal experience. Mm. Working as a full-time uh, woman, I found myself struggling to find that balance between being there for my children and my mm. husband, and working full-time in a professional job. I decided to stop as I got to a stage where I thought what is important in life, and of course, it's my husband and children. Mm. I believe that pursuing a career and working full-time should be done before marriage and before having children. After marriage, a woman can continue to work, but part-time if the opportunity exists, so that she can find it easier, easier to get that balance of being there for her family and working for herself. Well, this brings up another area, and that is mm. working from home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's an interesting area, absolutely, which I think absolutely. more can delve in. Although, let's not use that as an excuse. No. Also, I've worked the whole day from home. You know what? And the husband's like, where are you? I'm like, you know, one more thing, one more thing. I'm busy, one more thing. I'll come up in a second, one more thing. I'll come up in a second, one more thing. And before you know it, you're like, hold on a minute. You're more busy here than you were busy when you were working mm. outside. Mm. But I do think the working from home angle... Right. It's something important, but I, I think we've missed out a lot on the Islamic psychology of all of this. Okay, okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, there is great reverence for the mother. There's great reverence for the upbringing. There's great reverence for the religious, emotional, spiritual nourishment that is there. There's great reverence for the observing the rights of your wife and observing the rights of the husband. 
-hmm. And I just hope that more people pay attention to these areas rather than go with that tide that independence means freedom mm. and being at home requires emancipation. Yeah, sure. Because there are some ladies who are at home, I'll tell you what, they're educated, bright as you can get, charismatic, and they've done a brilliant job bringing up uh, a wonderful family. Yes, yep. yes. Um, thank you for that. Now, just to continue on from there, um, you mentioned high flyers, as it were, either the husband or the wife or both, as it were, and I'm going to throw in the other side as well shortly after. Um, so employing nannies or maids, as you want to call it, or pairs, look after children and so on and so forth. You mentioned obviously, you know, ticking a box because they don't want to go past the sell-by date. Yeah. Let's be frank, okay? But why do you think that's happening though? Do you think it's just, again, just issues around spirituality or that their fulfillment is basically to progress to actually obtain a six-figure salary or I think I think the husband has a major role uh -huh. in terms of the way they speak to their wife right as to how the wife's worldview also develops a husband can make his wife feel like a million dollars yeah when he sees the self-sacrifice that's involved from her even though she may have graduated from a university better than him mm. Mm. He can see that this lady from the morning, you know, the, 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 the female is an amazing creation. They can multitask much better than us. Yeah, For sure. me, if you put me now and you tell me that I'm trying to switch, I'm going to try and change the channel, answer the phone mm -hmm. and pick up a cup of tea, I'll be all over the place. Whereas you'll see her holding one child, laughing with the other, crying with the other, singing with the other trying to prepare that meal in the morning and, and your clothes there, the bus has come, the cars come. It, it's phenomenal. But a husband who doesn't appreciate can sometimes lead someone to think, you know what, maybe I've lived a mundane life, a mundane existence. They forget that what they're doing is divine. Yeah. There's a divine element to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But when that husband doesn't appreciate, yes, then sometimes that person will begin to think that, you know what, we can employ au pair nannies, I can go out and work. Mm -hmm. And it's not just because they want to fulfill some ambition, it's also because they feel that everything's gone past, everything's gone, they, they didn't really see what everyone else was doing, and that husband showing no appreciation. Yes. So sometimes the husband has a major role, and we, we got to make clear that having a nanny, having all these things at home is not forbidden. No, no, no. It's not forbidden. No. But when, the, when, when your kids have a better relationship with the nanny than with the mom, there's mm -hmm. an issue. There are some Arab kids in the Middle East. Yeah. Okay. I don't think they, they, they saw their mom too much. Yeah. The mom was either f lying on holiday somewhere, shopping somewhere, mm -hmm. and they've got, for example, a Filipino nanny or Sri Lankan nanny or a nanny from Africa. Right. These poor ladies are carrying these kids. And you know, some of these Middle Eastern kids, like, he, he's not a human, he's a chocolate walking. Okay. Because this guy's a fat kid walking around. Because <laughs> the mom's not there, so the nanny, the nanny has to quieten down. So you've got, like, you know, Santa Claus as a fat child walking around. I will never forget, you know, when I used to work at one department store, and I'll never forget this one kid from the Middle East with the nanny. Yes. No word of a lie, it must have taken him 20 minutes to come up the stairs. So it wasn't the escalator, it was your it was, it was classic stairs, yes, the glass yes, stairs. Yes, yes. Honestly, it must have taken 20 minutes to come up. His thighs were bigger than my whole body. This poor kid, who was his relation? Where's his mom? Yeah. Where's the mom? Yeah. Yeah. There's no mom. And mm. so if we're going to go into that world where, okay, both of us will work, but the kids have got no relationship with us yes. except gifts. Sure, you've been spoiled then that's an issue. Yeah. But far away from the ethos of yeah. religion. Yeah, two questions, Sid. Now, the production team have been quite adamant that I um, pose this question to you. Uh, Zamir Hussein, question for the show. In Islamic law, there's a law that may... Uh, I'm going to rephrase that. Um, 
what is the law by the scholars, or what does the yeah um, say that when a female is mature at the age of nine, um, must start obligations? Um, should it be looked at again, possibly reformed? So that's one question. Um, isn't it different for each person rather than a blanket age? Um, so yeah, so the, uh, that's basically it. Yeah. There is a debate for sure concerning, uh -huh. you know, when is the age of adolescence for the female? Right. And you find that normally the general opinion that's given is the age of nine. Mm -hmm. and you see that in many legal manuals. Mm -hmm. But there are certain scholars who have differed with this opinion. Okay. And some have even spoken of the age of 12 or the age of 13. Right. Some might say it's puberty, for example. Mm -hmm. Others might say the onset of the menstrual cycle, but yeah. the, onset of the menstrual cycle can even go much older than 13. Sure. Um, and so there is a debate there that right. some say that the obligations shouldn't begin at nine, should begin a few years later. So it's not everyone who has the opinion of the age of nine. Okay, fine. And the next question is, if I understand that women, is n women are not allowed to work outside in a Nahmarim atmosphere, that's the question he's asking, or she. Uh, but the situation is different nowadays because um, everyone's behaviors, everyone is so greedy to earn by hook or by crook. Um, my question is, how can we prevent this? This is from Amsterdam. So I suppose what the, um, the questioner wants to know is um, basically in today's Times, times have changed. Um, there's a Nahmarim atmosphere. Um, you know, uh, can we prevent it? Yeah, it's not an easy one because, no. as I said earlier, Ayatollah al Khoui is saying that women work, but they work in women only environments. Yes. But then you've got Ayatollah Sistani in the Code of Practice for Muslims in the West when such a book is is published, there's a recognition that, look, in the West, these environments are normally mixed environments. Mm -hmm. And he provides guidance on how you behave in these mixed environments. So as long as a person can maintain the social and physical hijab um, while living in the Western world, um, you know, they, they can reach the highest levels within their careers. But like we said, we have to make sure that the rights which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to observe mm -hmm. are not rights which are forfeited simply because yeah, of the yeah, career. Yeah, they're not compromised. Okay. Asalaamu Alaikum. My name is Bilal Raza. Thank you, Sayyidina. Your speeches have really inspired me. My question is, if the woman wants to work after marriage, whose decision is it? The husband's, her, or is it a mutual decision? If she's in a contract pre-marriage, if she's in a contract pre-marriage, and say the contract's a two-year contract, and she gets married a year into that contract, husband has no right to tell her to stop working. She can continue because there is a contract with that company for the two-year period. Right. Of course, then she can discuss it with them if she wants to, but the husband has no right. However, after marriage, mm -hmm. then the husband has every right to um, ask her um, not to uh, work while he's maintaining, which is his duty. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Um, thank you for that. Now, there's a question that I um, wanted to know, and I'm sure a lot of women out there, and this might not be, you might not be able to answer it now. I think there's a number of different factors in it. There's clearly an answer for it, okay? But a lot of women don't know why the man is compelled, or the man has the right, as it were, to lay down certain rules over a uh, wife, as it were. Um, the man has, uh, you know, he's, he's got no... Or there's not. Th th yeah, there's nothing whatsoever yeah. that the man can compel his wife to do. Hmm. He may have a right for his wife to be ready for him. Yeah. But in terms of the man, you know, you could compel your wife by saying to her that you've got to cook for me or clean for me. There's no rights there at all. And, um, and even if she works... He has no rights to take any of the money that no, she earns. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay, we've just got about four or five minutes. So um, I wanted to go back and revisit. You mentioned, we, we spoke a few minutes back about, um, you know, children, 
possibly been neglected, as it were, and you know, and I mentioned, and you also mentioned, you know, having a, a cook, a nanny, and so on and so forth. There's nothing wrong with that, and so on and so forth, within reason. Um, but let's look at the other side, in in terms of today's practical living conditions, um, whereby two people newly married, they're looking to get onto the property ma um, ladder, as it were, both looking to work, but perhaps the wife initially says, I don't want to work, and so on and so forth. What sort of constraints are involved now in, t in terms of today's society, in terms of having a successful marriage, you know, progressing, having children, and so forth? It might be quite a deep question, but we've only got a two, three minute session now left. Um, I, I think that a lot of the problems are the keeping up with the Joneses. There's this yeah. grass is green on the other side effect, right. where it's like, well, look at what they've done. Yeah, look at what they've done. You don't know whether there's a handout from the dad of the person helping his son get on that property ladder. Uh, you don't know what the issues are within the household. The main thing for you is help stabilize that marriage. Mm. Now, helping stabilize that marriage, they are the best judges of the way forward. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Islam is not going to have an issue that the man is working and the woman is working. This is between them. Their communication dictates which way they want to head. Yeah. Um, but the main thing is that they have an uh, understanding that the main sustainer of all of us, ultimate sustainer, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sure, sure. While we're doing things, you know, we can only, as the Quran says, laysa ala al-insani illa ma sa'a. You know, upon us is just a struggle and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the doors for us. Okay. But let's try and make sure that whether you're a male or a female, that we try and maintain that uh, Islamic ethos you know, the, the ethics, the morality of the religion of Islam, wherever we may be. And if we find that we're compromising this, then we may have to look for another way of building that household. Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay, I think we've run out of time. So from Dr. Sayyid Aman Ashwani. So I want to comment for myself, Muhammad Ali. Inshallah, hopefully we'll see you again next week and maybe we can continue the topic again, inshallah. Salaam. Hey.